so I need a volunteer. Rachel, you want to help me with this? Come on up. Help me, Rachel. Sure. So lead them all in this. I just want you to welcome them again. Tell them we're feeling good. We're feeling good? We're feeling right. It's Saturday night. Rachel, on. Wow. She's going to steal my job. You got it. That was awesome. She had no idea I was going to do that. You never know what's going to happen at the Haven on a Saturday night. We're so glad you're here. If you came in since we first said welcome, welcome again. Just a, a great opportunity to be together. Looking forward to all that God's going to do tonight. Before we move on, I just have to take a moment and just say thank you again, you guys, for your faithful giving. Um, you know, we just give you opportunity, but we've never passed an offering plate. We've never pressured. We don't hound you. We just, we just tell you what's there and let it, God lay it on your heart. We just kind of give you opportunity through giving stations, but never pass the plate and, and don't ever plan to. But some wonderful things are happening because of your faithfulness and giving. And because of all that's growing here, we are, of course, actively looking for the new Haven home. Now, I, I can't really share anything yet, but I can just tell you there's some things percolating. Yeah. So, you know, let's just see what happens a couple of weeks in the future, and hopefully real soon we'll have some good things to tell you. Last week we presented for the first time our new facility fund. We put a goal of $150,000, and if you look down there at the bottom, you'll see a little bit of yellow. That means we've had some money coming in already. Thank you so much, you guys responding. So it's already, it's already percolating. Yeah, within like three days, we got a little bit of reading on a thermometer. So we're looking to nail this thing, all right? So here's what we do. If you feel like you want to give above and beyond your regular giving, something just designated toward, you know, we know we're going to have to do a, you know, a, a retrofit or wherever we go, things like that. Uh, just designate it. Uh, if you give a check or, a, 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 or cash in the back giving station, just put building somewhere on that envelope when you put it in. If you're giving electronically, add a penny, and that'll give our treasurer the heads up that he's going to designate it only for the new facility fund. Is that cool? Awesome. Thank you, guys. So I have really uh, been so encouraged. We're in week three of this series on prayer. And uh, I, I just want to tell you, keep those texts and messages. Keep them coming. Because it's just awesome to hear from you guys directly, so many of you, on what God is doing to, to not only inspire you, but to have you put it in practice. Now, I said from the very beginning that, you know, so many in this journey, it's rather new. You know, you, you weren't a part of anything quite like this in the past. Or maybe it's been a long time. So there's been desire expressed over the months and years of being together to just keep growing. And one of the most beautiful ways is in your prayer life. And it's been my heart's desire and thrill to see God doing that in many of your lives. And then for those that have been in the faith a long time, you know, I was just praying that this, the word of God through this would be a catalyst for, for breaking you out of maybe a rut. Maybe it got a little dull and routine. And, and I, I just love what I'm hearing from you guys, that just God is, is moving in that way. And, of course, we've used as our launch verse Luke chapter 11 and verse number 1 which says, once Jesus was in a certain place praying, and as he finished, one of the disciples came to him and said, said these beautiful words, Lord, teach us to pray. Now you got to understand, what Jesus does next is in response to someone acknowledging they had a need. I love that about God. There was no demeaning. The next statement by Christ was not, really, you haven't been paying attention. You haven't, like, just done what I did. Christ responded in love, and he always does, because God is a God that allows us to approach him and say, Lord, I need you. And he has what we need, not only for the moment, but for the growth in our spiritual lives. Now, week number one, a couple weeks ago, we started by talking about the importance of prayer. I'm not even going to really recap it, but just to kind of move through it. Prayer first and foremost, God made us for fellowship with him. First and foremost, prayer is communication with God. That is bottom line. Then last week, we looked at that response that Jesus had to that man who said, teach us to pray, and we walked through line by line of the Lord's Prayer, or what many of us grow up knowing as the Our Father. And I just want to encourage you guys to, you know, stay connected, check out the videos, and, and also just, I, I know that many of you were paying attention that were here last week, because all week I kept getting texts that just had this on it. So those of you that were here, you know what's up, and, you know, I just say once again, keep them coming, and you guys, you just crack me up, you really do. But we post the messages so that you can not only stay connected, but also, you know, there's times that God's going to inspire down the road to revisit this. 
because it is the word of God and it is always fresh. It's not my preaching. It's not my delivery. It's the anointing of God and the power of his word that makes it ever effective. Love that. So from day one of this Haven Church experience, we have tried to have a culture that would encourage people asking questions. Just like the man that approached Jesus, the, the nameless disciple, that we would have a culture where no one would be demeaned or judged if they came, and, and it happens almost every service, come up to me and ask a question, a follow-up question. Some of it is something I can answer right away. Some of you are asking me like the Greek and the Hebrew. I get back to you on that, okay? I'm good. I'm not that good. But the beautiful thing is no one demeans, no one judges. Why? Because we don't learn unless we stay inquisitive, unless we ask questions. And it's beautiful, and I encourage it, not only of me, but keep asking questions of God. Probe his word, and he will give you the answers. And it's based on that, that just for a few minutes tonight, I won't keep you long. I want to I wanna go into the third installment of this series, and I want to call it Common Questions, Useful Answers. See, so I don't think there's any point in us getting together if you don't leave with something you can use. Every single time. No matter where you are in your relationship, if you don't leave with something you can use, then either you weren't listening or I didn't do a very good job. Because the word of God is applicable to each one of us. And so it will be tonight. I know that. Now we live in what is obviously known as, among many things, the information age. See, a few years ago when I was younger, like in high school, a few years ago when I was in high school, a few years ago, <laughs> if you wanted to really learn something, you had to do something so burdensome, so arduous, so like out of the way. You had to go to a library. <laughs> Some of you don't even know what a library is. You had to dig and research and you actually had to read a book. <laughs> but today, of course, information is everywhere and in particular, we can find so many things, how-to things in YouTube. Now, i got to be honest, I have learned and gleaned a lot on YouTube. If you want to learn to play an instrument, somebody on YouTube will teach you. Somebody has a lesson for anything. You want to learn the tuba? I promise you there's a tuba player. He'll teach you to play Freebird on the tuba. I know, he's on there. There's all kinds of things in any subject. And I recently had an experience of this. Now, I was driving somewhere. It was nighttime. Somebody was behind me that I knew, and they told me, your brake light is out. And? Because you've got to get that fixed. You're going to get a ticket. Okay, I get that. Fine. So rather than call a mechanic, see, I may look like a mechanic, but I'm not. <laughs> rather than call one, I'm thinking, it's a bulb. I got this. So I, and so I go to the auto parts. <laughs> we got a peanut gallery tonight. I just want you to know. Just, we didn't have one of those in the first service, I'll tell you. It was smooth sailing. So I go to the auto parts store, and I tell them to make your model. I tell them I need a brake light. They give me a pack of these two bulbs, and I'm like, okay, now what do I do with these? She goes, you just, I mean, it was a woman, you know, and I'm not demeaning, but she's looking at me like, what's wrong with you, dude? You pop the trunk, you look in, you put this where the other one is. I can do that. I drive home, park the car, pop the trunk, do not see where they go. <laughs> They're hidden. There's like rug or something, carpet thing. There's something blocking it. And I look where I think I can go to do it, but it looks to me like I'm going to have to break something to get in there. That can't be right. I know I looked like a mechanic, but even I knew that wasn't right. So you know what I did? YouTube. I go in and I type in the make, year, model, replacing brake light. Boom. I got a guy there with a video taking me through every step. Pops a trunk. Oh, there's these clips. You've got to turn them, and it loosens the thing, and then you pull the thing back from the thing. <laughs> And then there's the little thing. So I take out the bulb, I replace the bulb, I put it back in, I put everything back together, and I realize there's no way to tell if this works. 
how am I going to test the brake light? I did try. I put my foot on the brake to see if I could. No, I didn't really. So I had to wait till Debbie came home. And I couldn't wait. And Debbie walks in from a hard day at work. And I was like, babe, you got to come see. I did it. She said, you made the bed? What's up with that, by the way? I'm just going to get back in it in a couple hours. Why do I have to make the bed? Somebody explain that to me. I got issues with that one. I said, no, babe, I did not make the bed, but I changed the brake light. And she was like, whatever, and just kept going on about her business. But I learned how to do it from a portal of information. Now, where we're going tonight is, I just want to concentrate on a few questions pertaining to prayer. Now, I believe that we have, you know, the, the portal to all the information for these questions. We're going to search the scriptures. I don't want you to hear my opinion. I want you to hear God's word. And I truly believe that there are questions that have been brought to me and, and, and kind of laying here in a group of people that we're going to address. And some of us are going to have breakthrough and some of us are going to grow. And some of us are going to be convicted. But because of it, some of us are going to grow. Let's move forward, shall we? Here's the first one. Why do we pray before eating? Or why do we say grace? Now, I would love to say the reason we do is by praying over your food, it removes all the calories, it reduces all the trans fats, it makes food taste better, and even improves your cooking skills. I'd love to say that, but that, of course, is not true. Speaking of which, I just have to give you some information because I love you. So the next time you eat bacon, you may have to pray a little harder over it. Because, you see, I read this this week, and it was an article saying bacon is really killing us. I know, right? It's awful. Decades worth of research proves that chemicals used to make bacon, blah, 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 yada, 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 delicious. All right? So I'm just declaring tonight, this is fake news. Ignore it when you see it. Enjoy your bacon. All right? Enjoy your bacon. Oh, I'm having way too much fun. I'm telling you. I'm having way too much fun. No, why do we pray for our food? We pray for our food because Jesus gave us the example. Well, isn't that awesome? He's our Savior. He's our Lord. He's the one we're following. Do you know that he showed us it is proper, it is right to pray for your food? Here's two examples to start off with. First of all, in Matthew 14, Jesus has just fed or is about to feed about 5,000 men, maybe 20,000 people. Little dude has a little lunch. Jesus takes the five loaves, the two fish. He looks up to heaven and he said a blessing. Then in Matthew 15, 36, another group, about 4,000 people. Who knows, 18,000 in total. He takes seven loaves and the fishes. And having given thanks, he broke them. He gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowd. So Jesus shows us by example. Now he is God, but he still showed us when God provides, it is right, it is proper to give thanks and to ask him to bless it. It's proper. There's another time in the New Testament, it's after Jesus has risen from the dead. He is walking on a road to Emmaus with a couple disciples that don't know it's him and think Jesus is dead. They get at the end of the road, they're sitting around the table eating. I love that about Jesus. He loved to eat. It's awesome. He's at the table with them. He takes the bread, he blessed, and he broke it, and he passed it out. There's another example. It's the Apostle Paul. He is shipwrecked on an island. They get provisions from the locals there. When Paul had said some things to them, he took the bread and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, which means out loud, he broke it and began to eat. So why do we pray before eating? Because God's word says we should. Because Jesus gave us the example. I can tell you, if you're a parent, doing this around your dinner table sets a beautiful atmosphere and training time for your children. It lets them know that we always acknowledge everything we had came from him. But dad, didn't you work the job? Yes, I did. But God gave me the strength. 
And God gave me the wisdom and the ability. So through that job, I get paid. Mom buys the food. Mom probably cooks it. But now it's here and we're giving thanks to God. And then we ask him to bless it. And we say, Lord, just let this be nourishment. And let this give us strength to serve you better. Jesus did it. We should do it. And I'll tell you another good and valuable and practical reason to do it. In public, it can be a wonderful testimony. Many of us in this room have stories of praying and somebody coming up and either commenting or reconnecting. I was having lunch with a guy not too long ago, and, and we bowed our heads and we said prayer in a public place. And the waitress waited, and she came over. She said, it moves me to see you pray. I haven't been in church in years. I miss it so much. And it gave us opportunity. So you see, God can take simple obedience and use it to touch someone's life. It's an awesome thing. All right, let me go to another question. To kneel or not to kneel? What about postures of prayer? Is there a right way to pray posture-wise? Is there an acceptable? Is there a way that's better, that's going to help my prayer get answered quicker? Well, let's walk through it. First of all, in John chapter 17, verse 1, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and in this case, he raised his eyes to heaven in prayer and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that your son may glorify you. This, they tell us, was a traditional Hebrew way of praying. He was standing. His eyes were open. He was looking to heaven, and that's how Jesus was praying in this instance. So it's okay to pray standing with your eyes open looking toward heaven. Here's another, 1 Timothy 4.8. In every place of worship, the Apostle Paul writes, I want men, or everyone basically, to pray with holy hands lifted up to God, free from anger and any controversy. So there's an acceptable way of praying, whether sitting or standing, with your hands raised to God. Offering those prayers almost physically as well. Here's another one. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he walked away from his disciples to get alone. About a stone's throw, Scripture says. And here, Jesus knelt and prayed. Now we know from reading the story that Jesus was in agony. and He was struggling, the human part of him, with the will of God. But the kneeling position, obviously, is a position of humility. And there are times when you're just going to feel, I got to kneel. I just got to bow before God. It's not that you're unworthy. And it's not that standing is not good. It's that kneeling is another way of expressing your communication to God. Here's one, Matthew 26, 39, another example. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus goes a little further away, and he bowed with his face to the ground, which basically means he lies on the ground with his face down. And he prayed. I can tell you there have been times of anguish and struggle in my life where that's how I prayed. I was like, God, I, I just have to get humbled before you. I just have to, it's, again, it's not that God is oppressive. It's that I felt this desire and need to express my, my worship to him, to express my uh, respect for him by laying flat and pouring out my heart. So here's the bottom line. Your prayer posture is not as important as the condition of your heart. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? They're all acceptable. God says, I have, I have made all kinds of people with all kinds of different personalities. Believe me, I see it during a worship service. There is such a variety of expression in a room this full on a night like this with a variety of music, and I love it, and God loves it, but so it is with prayer and posturing. Face toward heaven, stand, sit, head bowed, kneel, lying face down, eyes open or eyes shut. They are all appropriate and acceptable. It's an expression of your heart at that moment. I'm so glad that God allows me to pray while I'm driving. You know, that's not in the Bible. You'll figure that one out when you get home, but... Some of you. But I love that. I can just drive down the road and talk to God, and guess what? He's listening. 
And you go, well, that's not on the list. I don't see that in Scripture. It's a condition of the heart. Like, God, I am here, and it's you and me, and I'm taking an opportunity to have a conversation with my Father who is in heaven. All right, let me keep moving on, and let me ask this question. What's the deal with fasting? Uh Uh-oh. Now, I can't in good conscience, as a good pastor, trying to be a good pastor, and as your brother and as your friend, I cannot deal with the subject of fasting without dealing with the subject of being hangry. I just, I got to go there, bro. I got to. You see, being hangry is a state of anger caused by lack of food. Hunger causing a negative change in emotional state. I mean, it's a real issue. Anybody else suffer from it? I have it bad. I have it. Come on, you guys. I knew you were out there. I knew it. Wow, both of you, husband and wife, get hangry? That's got to be dangerous in that home. Whoo. Keep some protein bars handy. See, it's, it happens, and sometimes it's actually worse for the people we're with. You know, it really is. But here's what I want to tell you. Fasting is more than missing a meal. Now, the meal he's pushing away looks like there's peas and carrots in there. So I'm going to make it a little more indicative of a sacrifice. I'm sorry. I know it's bad for you, but it's so good. It's more than missing a meal. So let me walk through some teaching here because I'm telling you, this can really open your heart and your eyes and have some breakthrough in your personal walk with God. So I put this on the screen because I I don't want you to miss it. The purpose of fasting should be to take our eyes off the things of this world to focus completely on God. By temporarily depriving ourselves, we dedicate that time to prayer and spiritual discipline. Let me give you a couple of practical things. If the Lord lays it on your heart to fast a meal and you are physically able. Now let me just tell you, there's some folks that physically can't. God isn't going to make you pass out and say, that's what I want from you. Use wisdom. Some of you on medications, use wisdom. God is not the guy over your head with a stick saying you got to do it. There are other ways to fast. For example, you may want to fast social networks, social media for a while. Now, I know that might be tougher than food for some. Turn it off. Give God an hour. And in that hour, listen to worship music. Think on the Lord. Pray. Pray for me if you got nothing else to pray for. Pray, Pray for this church. Pray for my wife. Seriously, you can fast television. You can fast casual phone conversations, leisure activity. Here's what it is, practically speaking. Take a period of time if you feel the Lord leading you to this. And you sacrifice something to him. Put something on a metaphoric altar where just like in the Old Testament, he will come, he will accept it, consume it, and then his blessing and presence and power comes with it. Give him that and give yourself the opportunity to experience it. Now let me make it clear. The New Testament, it is not a command for Christians to fast in the New Testament. But it is encouraged And fasting is an acceptable form of sacrifice to God. You temporarily give up something that brings you pleasure and joy. Temporarily. And in that time, you focus on him. And I'm telling you, it is a sacrifice that God will be pleased with. But here's what else it is. It is a powerful spiritual weapon. Listen to me. Let me walk through some. First of all, you need a breakthrough? Here's an example. Matthew 17, 21. There's a man with a demon demon uh, possession situation. The disciples are praying. They're the disciples of Jesus, like really holy guys, and nothing happens. Jesus comes up, prays, casts out the demon, and he basically says some spiritual battles only are won through prayer and fasting. You need a breakthrough? Give it a shot. Arm yourself with renewed power through this experience. 
I love this in the Old Testament. Daniel was in a mess. His nation was in a mess. His culture was a mess. Daniel 9, 3, he said, so in the middle of my mess, I turned to God and pleaded with him in prayer and fasting. And guess what? God came through. Deliverance, healing, overcoming addiction, relationship issues, marital issues. They can be overcome if and when the Spirit leads you to fast and pray. It is a powerful resource. Here's what else fasting is. It's a, it's a portal for divine direction. Now this is just one example. We, we actually looked at this a few weeks ago in another study, but I want to bring it up. Acts 13, 2. One of the days the men were worshiping the Lord. They were fasting and worshiping, and it's in that atmosphere that the Holy Spirit spoke and told them who to anoint and who to appoint and who to send to do the mission God called them to do. The answer, the direction came through a time of fasting. Need a new job? Struggling with what's next in your life? Practical issues? Perhaps ask God if he's going to lead you into a moment, a time, a season, an afternoon of fasting telling you you do it with a sincere heart and God will show up but I want to warn you on this it must be a personal act of obedience now I know a lot of churches do church-wide fasting I'm nothing against that we'll probably do that one day when the Lord directs me but even in a corporate setting of fasting we are not supposed to broadcast it or look to receive any kind of attention for it Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 16 through 18. And when you fast. uh Uh-oh, what word? Hmm. When you fast. The assumption is sooner or later, the Holy Spirit's going to nudge you and say it's time. Don't dread it. Look forward to it. Something good is coming. So he says when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do. For they try to look miserable and disheveled so that people will admire their fasting. That's pathetic. But they did it. And here's what Jesus says. I tell you the truth, that is the only reward they'll ever get. That attention where people said, oh, you're so holy. Look at you. Your hair's a mess. Your face is a mess. You didn't put makeup on. You're not using Rodan and Fields today. You just look disheveled and a total disaster. Shameless plug. And yet, these people were trying to broadcast that they were so holy. They were fasting. Oh, look at us suffer for God. Jesus said, you know what you should do when you fast, when you fast, when you fast? Comb your hair. Wash your face. Look presentable. That no one will be able to say, oh, they must be fasting. Look how holy they are. No, no, no. Jesus finishes up with this. He says in that, in that 18th verse, he said, because no one will notice that you're fasting except your father. It is personal obedience. Remember, all through this series, it is about you and God, communication, what he created us for. And fasting is another way to connect with him, and he sees in private, and then he will reward you in public. (laughs) You want to tap into that? Let God lead you into some fasting. So let me repeat. The purpose of fasting should be to take our eyes off of the things of this world. To focus completely on God. By temporarily depriving ourselves, we dedicate that time to prayer and spiritual discipline. And may I add, fasting can take us to deeper levels in our relationship with God. Let Him lead you. Don't do it because I told you to. You pray about it and let God lead you. Make sure it's him. And then when it is, you do it in obedience and watch God come through. Now here's what I want to caution you before I move on. Caution you on this. Fasting is not a bargaining chip. You know, it's not us saying, okay, God, I'm giving you this lunchtime. Can I have that new job? Okay, God, I'm giving you this this dinner time. And as a matter of fact, I'm not only not eating... But while I'm not eating, I'm not going to watch TV, and I'm not going to get on my phone. That's a huge sacrifice. But if we go and say, I'm doing this to receive that, that's not proper. And that does not bring God's favor. 
and God will convict you and set your heart right, and then you can get it straight. So it's a tool, it's a resource, but it is not a bargaining chip. Let me go one more question, and I'll let you go. Do I really have to pray out loud? Uh-oh. Wow. I've actually heard this a lot. I've heard this a lot, especially in this series. We had a man cave a couple of weeks ago right after the first message in this series, and we talked about a lot of practical issues, and this one came up. Why is it so awkward to pray out loud? Why does the devil whisper in your ear, you sound ridiculous? You're not holy enough to pray out loud. Keep your mouth shut and just think your prayers. Why does he do that? Because he does not want you to experience the power that comes with vocally expressing your relationship, your faith before God. I know some of you are going, can't we just move on to the next subject? I don't want to hear about this one. And others might be going, you know, I just, I'm more of a reserved person. Can't I just pray in my head? Because God knows my thoughts, right? Can't I just think about it all the time? Well, let's walk through it scripturally. First of all, in the very first verse we looked at, Luke 11, 1, Jesus prayed. Somebody responded. What do you think? Jesus was praying out loud. He was using his voice. And the man heard it, the nameless disciple. And that inspired this whole Lord's Prayer. So Jesus not only told his disciples how to pray, but by his example, he showed them how to pray. When you study, there's approximately 25 prayers that Jesus prayed in his three and a half year ministry. I'm sure he prayed more than that. But the Bible shows us about 25 of them. And most of them he is verbalizing as a means to not only communicate with God, but to send a message to those around and also to teach. Now, Hebrews 5, 7 tells us this about our Lord. You may have not realized this. But it says, while Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and with tears. It's okay to pour out your heart to God. And it's okay to be vocal about it. And I promise you, if you start it in your own private prayer time, it will become more and more natural when you get in a corporate setting. And why is that important? Well, let me take you to Acts chapter 4 and 24. The church, the first church, they're meeting. They get a really bad report. You know how they respond? All the believers. Would you say all? all. Lifted their voices together. Would you say together? They lifted their voices together in prayer to God. Woo-wee. You get in a room where people are praying out loud and expressing their praise and expressing their faith and crying out for God, and they're doing it, and it's in a corporate setting. It is powerful. It's not magical. It's not any more supernatural than prayer in general, but there is something about corporate prayer. And you know what happened on this one? You got to read it for yourself. God showed up. God showed up. Power fell. Spirit moved. Prayers were answered. I'm telling you, it is a wonderful thing to grow in confidence with God and those you worship with to the point where you can vocally and verbally pray out loud. And let me give you something to think about. Ask yourself this question. Has anyone ever prayed for you in church? Anyone ever taken you by the hand? Anyone ever put their arm on your shoulder? Anybody ever pray for you? Think of how much it blessed you. Imagine doing that for someone else, encouraging someone else the way you were encouraged when that person took a risk. You know, it's kind of risky praying for somebody out loud. I mean, what if they just look at me and go, dude, what are you talking about? What? That's the worst prayer I ever heard. It's a risk. But here's why it's worth it. Because it's a step of faith, and God honors faith. And chances are, 
in a loving community that we are all so blessed to be a part of on this night and most, most nights that we're together in a community like this. No one is going to push you away. They're going to take that prayer, receive that prayer. Thank you for that prayer. Why? Because God uses us to minister to each other. I can't possibly pray for everybody, but we can pray for each other. And you have just as much power and authority as I do. You have just as much connection and opportunity to stand on God's word and express your faith in prayer as I do. Don't let the devil say you don't pray like Pastor Paul or somebody else. Don't because you are still allowed to be yourself. It's your vocabulary. It's who you are. God wants to use you. And then let me say this about it one more time. Praying audibly is a wonderful part of spiritual warfare. It puts it out there to hell. It puts it out there to the enemy of your soul. What you're feeling, what you're declaring, what you're standing on, what you're believing in, and who is your source. Yeah. Yeah. So I encourage you. Ask questions. Keep growing. Let God continue to draw us closer to him. And I want to remind you of this. Prayer is an expression of your personal relationship with God. It is not today what it will be a year from now. And as it develops and grows, so will aspects of your prayer life. So will aspects of your entire walk with him. You will learn more about him. You will grow in him. But one of the greatest ways of expressing, maturing, and that relationship development is through your prayer development. God wants to hear your voice. Now we're going to do something tonight, and we'll do it probably from time to time. You see, I'm going to practice what we preach. And from time to time, including tonight, over in this corner to my left, your right, we're going to have some folks that are going to pray with you. Who have we got in the house tonight that are going to come help us pray? Come right now, if you would, please. And here's what I'm going to ask. Amanda's going to come and help. We're going to worship a little bit. We're going to sing a little bit. If you're in this house with any need at all, you need healing, you need direction, you need power, you need strength, you need forgiveness, you need endurance, whatever it is, these are just people from the pews. From the seats that have enough faith to believe that God hears and God answers those prayers of faith. And I believe that he is going to, in this service, just as he did in the first service, he's going to meet some needs. And he's going to bless some people. And here's another reason we're doing it. Because some of us that are developing in our prayer life, you're going to hear some folks pray and you're going to learn from it. You're going to learn from it. You don't have to be them. You shouldn't be them. But you can learn from it. That it can be so simple. It can be soft. It can be whoever you are. But if it's a prayer of faith, God will heal and God will answer. Bow your heads for just a moment. Father, we are going to, we're going to take some time tonight to act upon your word. And we are going to take some time tonight to minister to our brothers and sisters. And so I release in this place the power of the Holy Spirit to connect through the prayer of faith. And as you told us in the book of James, if we gather the elders of the church and pray, the sick will be healed, those in sin will be forgiven, and needs will be met. So move among us tonight in Jesus' name. We're going to sing a little bit. If you've got a need, if you need prayer tonight for anything, those are your brothers and sisters. They're waiting to pray for you. Let's sing Amanda. All who are thirsty And all who are weak You can come to the fountain Dip your heart in the streams of life Let the pain and the sorrow Spirit I'm praying he goes home with you situation you tread on Monday, he's waiting, he's going to be there. Holy Spirit.
Take this word, live this word. Let's keep growing. Let's keep growing.